Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Steve Goody speaking here from Property Tutors in Wellington. Uh, got a couple of hundred people on the line there. I just wanted to test and make sure that everybody can hear me. So if you can see the webinar software panel on the right hand side of your screen there, and you could just type in there uh, whether you can hear me or not, and maybe where you are regionally around New Zealand. That's always a perennial favourite. And uh, I can see who's online and who's not and say good day. So Auckland, Hamilton, yeah, there's got a pile of people coming through, some good old Wellington stuff in there as well. Excellent. Great to have everybody online tonight. Um, yep, looks like we're loud and clear, even in matter matter. Fantastic. All right, we're lucky enough tonight to have uh, Matthew Gilligan from Gilligan Rowan Associates, who is uh, New Zealand's preeminent uh, accountant, entities and structures expert, and um, also property expert. and. Um, uh, seems to be the uh, accountant of choice for just about every really serious property investor around the country. Um, we've worked together for many, many years and um, we're lucky enough to have Matt on the line tonight with a whole pile of information about what's going on in the Auckland market right now, Auckland Unitary Plan and Development, and we're going to bypass that and step out into all sorts of other interesting avenues if we get a chance as well. So uh, Matthew, can you come through loud and clear out there? Yes, thanks Steve. Uh, good evening to you and good evening to the listeners. Uh, thanks for inviting me along this evening. And, That's great. Uh, and the software here I've handed over to you so you should be able to um, run your own slide from that end of the stage and uh, look, go for it. Thank you. Hoping that we're going to start to move. So uh, thanks for the introduction. Now for those of you that don't know me, I'm a Chartered Accountant and uh, Property developer, which is an unusual combination, but between those two activities, I guess my day job is helping people set up the tax and legal structures in the GRA tax team that I run. Uh, at GRA we've got around 90, just over 90 full-time staff and a mixture of clients who are in business and property. And I guess the, the common theme is that they uh, enjoy the fact that Gilligan Row are not only tax advisors, but we are also investors, and in my case, I develop property to hold it. Uh, and that's because it's commercially uh, very good, and it's also uh, tax efficient, which I'll explain further. I've got a couple of books out, and sorry, I'm just having trouble with these slides. I click once and it clicks forwards too. Um, so I've got a couple of books out that you could get on our website there at gra.co.nz forward slash books. Uh, property 101, and Tax Structures 101, and it was really one book, but it got a little bit thick, and so I broke the tax out into a separate book. It's a couple hundred pages long, and it gives you a very good overview of how to arrange your affairs for asset protection and tax minimization. And the uh, property book is all about uh, sort of a strategic view of property and focuses on uh, some of my strategies, uh, and also talks a lot about the property tutors. Uh, very clever strategies too, which we partner with them uh, in assisting their clients to deliver. So this evening, uh, I'm going to have a fairly close focus on the Auckland property and zoning changes because we get a lot of requests for information on that. I uh, look at some of my developments and sit back also and have a wee look at the uh, general market in terms of what's going on. And Steve, I, I thought maybe we should start there and have a chat about that together. Are you still there? Yeah, absolutely. Hmm. Yeah, so uh, what I've seen uh, happening up here is increase, increasing reticence and concern that the market's peaking out. Um, people think that the cash yields up here are very low. Um, the LVR rules have got tighter and tighter. Uh, there's been various threat to the foreign buyers in the form of changes to the tax rules and foreign compliance requiring them to give IRD numbers and so forth. And in more recent times there's been a withdrawal of finance to them. Uh, foreign buyers uh, are struggling to get finance in New Zealand now from main, uh, mainstream bankers, which is an Australasian wide change. So it's really a game of two halves. On the funding side of things you've got low interest rates and the banks still with an appetite to lend because they've got to make money, but these new rules coming in uh, affecting uh, foreign buyers, the LVR rules at 60% withdrawing capital to investment property um, 
people. And uh, of course, on the construction side of things, there's been a more recent withdrawal of finance or reduction of finance available to property developers. Banks are lending less and less for construction finance. So it's, it's kind of confusing because you go out there at the moment, the uh, number of days to sale or number of weeks to sell have really uh, blown out from three weeks at the peak of it to over five weeks at the moment. This is the feedback I'm getting from agents I'm talking to. Yeah, it's still not getting a lot though, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's still very point really, but it's still, yeah. it's the, the times are changing. The, the prices are still high, but there's about an 80% pass-in rate at the auctions I'm attending uh, with properties not selling at the auction, they're selling after auction, uh, but certainly not at auction, you know, only about 20% of them are selling under the hammer. So you're getting, uh, getting high prices, but you're not getting the auction clearance rates that there were, the number of days to sell are slower. Against this, you've got a reduction of funding to investors and uh, I guess um, very low interest rates. So, you know, low interest rates is a positive, the rest of it's um, quite tough on investors. If you look at the big picture, net migration, of course, is still peaking out in at full throttle. And it's a, a big political thing uh, in the in the papers with in, in the media uh, and politically in Parliament, Winston Peters leading leading the drive, uh, saying that we should reduce the amount of immigration, and then on the other side of the fence, you're saying, well, we need these migrants to work because we sh our uh, economy is hot and we need the workers to come in and build the houses and run the economy. So that argument's raging. Um, next year. That I think that will be a massive election topic, housing affordability and uh, the net migration putting pressure on housing supply and that putting pressure on affordability. Um, and I think next year, which is sort of that cyclical peak, if you say, well, when does the market peak out traditionally? 87, 97, 2007, uh, on, I know it's anecdotal, but uh, in past performance, it's not a guarantee of future performance, but certainly you'd have to say that there's a pattern going on there, and on that pattern, the peak should be 2017. Um, and I would put a question mark on that and say, well, has the Reserve Bank uh, manufactured an early peak by bringing in these loan to value ratio rules for investors at 60? Uh, and there's talk in the wind of hybrid income rules coming in, which Will, will be an absolute uh, showstopper if they bring those in. You know, four and a, your income's got to be four and a half times interest in the UK, and they're talking about bringing those rules into New Zealand. So if you needed a 40% deposit and your income to be four and a half times your interest, uh, your interest cost as a ratio, that would really um, withdraw capital to the to the property market. So it hasn't happened, and there's no reason to say it's definitely going to happen, but there's kind of mixed messages and I think that's causing people to pause the withdrawal of the 40 of finance down to the 40% deposit requirements. That's really uh, kicked a lot of my clients in the pants and uh, made it much harder to be a property investor and that's why auction clearance rates are, are slowing and, and things are cooling up here. Um, what are you seeing in Wellington? Well Wellington's a a game of two halves, to be fair. Um, we, we just started warming up when these LVR restrictions came in, and um, we, we saw a lot of Auckland investors coming down to Wellington um, because you could borrow at 80%, um, there was yields, and we were half the price of Auckland properties in general. Um, when the LVR restrictions came in, there was a, a momentary pause, if you like, and then people realised that Wellington is still um, you know, massively undervalued nationwide, um, and uh, you know, even with the increase we've had in the last six or seven months, with the market here going absolutely spastic, we're still half the price of the of the same house in Auckland. But um, you know, from the property traders that I know of in the Auckland market, what they've seen, I suppose, is this first round of LVR restrictions came in, you know, quite a few months ago, and the market just sort of paused for two or three months, and then everybody realised that the sky wasn't going to fall in, and they bowled back in again. Um, 
and I, I kind of think of it to a degree that that's the pause we need, we're sort of having now at this stage, and that um, you know probably just before or just after Christmas, people are going to realise that the Auckland market's still the Auckland market. There's still huge net immigration, and um, things will rocket back off again, no matter what the yields sit at. To be fair, you know. Mm, yeah, well, there's certainly obviously very tight supply, and the government talk about producing fourteen thousand houses a year, and mm. that's a historic peak. Uh, but the, you know, those are consents. Are they all getting built? Um, and it's so hard to to get a consent. The red tape is just phenomenal, and the unitary plans still an appeal. So aspects of that are not operating yet, which is frustrating supply. Uh, so supply is still severely restricted. Services are coming under more and more pressure because if you're intensifying the land use in an area, if you've got 10,000 people there and suddenly you're going to have 30,000 people living there over a decade, well, you need bigger pipes. You need more power, more telecommunications and infrastructure. And that takes decades to put it. You've got to find something to pay for it. You can't put it all over the ratepayers. So Auckland's... Uh, up against the wall on supply, there's so many things structurally against the supply, not just um, not just the red tape of getting a consent and the rezone of the land, but the services to support the new land use. And I, I think, think that's... It's finally build costs are starting to move as well, it's getting more expensive to actually build this stuff too, you know? It really, it really is, yeah. So look, I think um, Auckland is pretty bulletproof, it's not going to go down. I don't see it being a housing bubble that's going to crash down. That's one statement I'll make. Uh, the reason why I say that is it, it has such a historic uh, lag in supply versus demand, all the pent up demand and, and unsatisfied demand uh, is, is one thing that it's got going for it. Another is, you know, the Reserve Bank talks about prudential controls, but I actually think it's social engineering that's going on here. Because over two years ago, we bought in the 20% deposits, and since then, the market's up about 20%. So you've got all that fat. 20% property investors had 20% on top of their, in terms of their growth, which makes them quite insulated from a shock in the market. If the market falls 10%, it doesn't put them out the back door. Then we went to 70% loan to value ratios, and the market's probably up 10, 15% since then. And now we've gone to 60. So in terms of a market insulated from shocks, sure, Auckland is, is expensive relative to former historic peaks, but it's also insulated by these uh, quite tough lending rules and the growth that's happened on top of them. So if it does come off the peak, let's say we get a, raise in, a, a rise in interest rates, uh, sorry, turning off my phone. <laughs> Let's say we get a rise in interest rates. Um, maybe Deutsche Bank tips over, which is something that's been in the papers, or maybe it's one of the pigs, Portugal, Ireland, Italy, Greece, Spain, uh, you know, in, in the European community. Who knows? You know, Spain's banked out of France. France is banked out of America. So if you get Spain tipping over, it affects France, which affects America, and suddenly you have a global withdrawal of liquidity from any one of these shock events, it could spike interest rates, we have GFC2. So for that type of event, of event a spike in interest rates can very quickly uh, cause a lot of insolvency in New Zealand. But in terms of who's most insulated from it, well you'd have to say Auckland has the strongest demand, it's had tremendous growth in the last uh, four years on top of the quite strong prudential controls that the Reserve Bank put on here ahead of the rest of the country. So all of that I think is going to make Auckland uh, quite resilient in the next down cycle. So I, I think Auckland's in good shape. The rest of the country, Tarong is up 50%, Hamilton's up about 40 Wellington's up about uh, 34 uh, when I last looked. Uh, so these, they're cycling behind Auckland and the regions are all cycling behind Auckland. Auckland traditionally booms first, the Auckland boom ripples out into the regions uh, just through affordability, the lack of supply. So it's too expensive here. People sell the sell the Auckland mansion, move to a smaller town where things are cheaper, pay off their debt, live debt free, and so forth. They downshift, and that's that that downshift process 
and lack of affordability and uptime causing ripple effect is in full thrust at the moment. But the unusual thing for the cycle, the property cycle, is the reduction of, of funding for property investors. That is quite unusual and quite disruptive. Uh, but you know, for, for reasons discussed, I think Auckland is quite resilient uh, just because Auckland has had so much equity because of the rules put on them by the Reserve Bank plus the growth. Interesting you say, Steve, that uh, you know, Wellington's half the price of Auckland. Um, I you know, shared your view earlier in the year and hired a full-time property investor and put him uh, in Wellington buying property in Wellington because you did right, the yield down there is incredible. You go up the hunt. And uh, so you get amazing cash yields. And then out came, and, and it was 80% LVRs down there, 60 in Auckland. Uh, so I thought, oh, well, I'll start to deploy some capital down there, put a, put a finder down there and start up buying. And uh, he's a clever guy. He's one of your students who taught him very well. So he's, he's buying me um, houses with good cash flow down there. And then out come the LVR rules at 60% and uh, across the whole country. And I look at Wellington suddenly and it's lost its shine to me, you know, because it, it just requires twice as much capital to do what I was doing. So if I'm a, a litmus test for the community of investors, uh, then, you know, I've lost my appetite. <laughs> um, and you can see that slow down about a town that's investing in Wellington reflected through my attitude towards it. Yep, mm. to a degree. I mean, um, you tell me what's more likely to happen, Auckland doubles in value in the next five years or Wellington does? Oh yeah, 100%. I mean, it's your turn. You won it this time. <laughs> Steve and I often you know, debate and for the last three years I've been giving him a hard time saying Auckland's, it's Auckland's turn, look at Wellington's historic capital growth rates. Um, Auckland's going to get it. And we did get it. But, uh, you know, fair point. Uh, you're behind in the cycle, and you, you're getting your catch up now. So, good place to put money. Uh, you know, good prospect, good chance of growth there. And while you're waiting for the growth, if you buy in areas that traditionally have yield, you can get really good cash flow down there. Should we have a look at some of these uh, property and zoning changes? Sure. Hoping that my slides work. So, <clears throat> often I rabbit on about zoning changes and things, and people say, you know why are you talking about this? So I thought rather than talk about zoning changes, I took, I'd show an example of a subdivision that I'm doing and how I make money out of it, and then we'll talk about zoning, uh, zoning changes so you can see the context. So this is a, a property in Bruce Burr Way, which is out in Glendean. It's a relatively average suburb in Auckland, in West Auckland. You can see it's a, an 1150 metre rear site, a fairly unremarkable site. Very interesting thing that, that I've found, having compared the Auckland market to the Wellington market, Steve, is that people talk about there being no land in Auckland, but actually look at the size of all these sections. They're all quite large sections, well over 600 metres, and that's an 1100 metre block and there's lots of them in that area. And you go to Wellington and you look for large blocks in the central areas, there's none, because Wellington's predominantly got no density rules. So you can stack as many houses onto the site as you like as long as you comply with height in relation to boundary and uh, you know, the um, rest of the development rules in terms of driveway width and um, site coverage and impermeable surfaces and all that sort of stuff. So Wellington's actually got all these little small sections in the central suburbs and I went down there looking for nice big blocks of land to buy and sit on and couldn't find any until I went up the hut. Uh, so it's obviously up the hut and further out, but very hard to get blocks of land like this in the CBD fringe and uh, the central Wellington areas. Whereas in Auckland, this stuff's everywhere. It's just had the wrong zoning. And yeah, you've got uh, lots of them, but they're so tightly held. There's so few of them on the market, and they get snapped up so quick. So uh, you know, you find because it's gone. Well, you know? I think that's um, that's. Oh, are you talking about Wellington or Auckland? Auckland, yeah. Oh, to be honest, um, there's a lot of land on the market in Auckland, and there, a lot of the sites are 900 metres plus, and it's actually pretty easy to get. Mm. Uh, it's, it's a big market here, and I, I could buy probably three sites a week if I had the capital and the appetite to do it. They're here. Uh, but let's look at this one. This is 1150 metres, and I'll use the mouse to point to the house in the middle, stupidly positioned. 
uh, you know, what was the developer thinking? He just dumped the house in the middle on an odd angle. Here's a garage. So I'll knock down that garage, I'll move the house to that corner, I'll put another little house here in the corner, a garage here, and then I'll build two up here. So this is a you know one into three subdivision, not a very big one. Uh, for this one, the uh, former zoning let me do this. It let me build a house with a minor dwelling, and out the back, uh, lift and shift the existing house and put that garage in the corner there. So one into three. Now that was compliant, and and I like this slide because it points out the council can be flexible. So in this, even in Auckland. So in this slide, I said to them, well, I can put this minor dwelling here, but that's not maximising the use of the land, and it looks very much the same as two houses. There's very little difference in form. And so they looked at this and said, yes, we agree with you, and they let me do it. So, of course, a two-lot subdivision, those sections are worth about 450 each in Auckland. A three-lot subdivision, the extra section is another 450 grand doesn't make any difference that it's a third smaller in this area. So if you, if you can get that extra lot, you buy it as a two lot subdivision, you get that third lot uh, that's an extra 450 grand in your pocket. It's well, well worth uh, striving for and paying those town planners and scrapping for it. So let's look at the numbers on this. Uh, I paid 725 for 1150 metres uh, in Glen Dean, and that was late last year. Uh, I built two houses. I do my subdivision and my funding cost in there. The services are on site, which makes it quite easy. Uh, those uh, three houses on separate titles come in at about 2.25. So I've got uh, two houses that are worth a little bit more because they're brand new and one second hand house. So 2.25, so there's a net gain of 660 in there. So if I borrowed 100%, if I could borrow 100%, I would have a 70% fully developed LVR, meaning my cost over the market value at the end is 70%. So I'm only locking up 10% of the total amount of equity that I put in, or 10% of the market value, which is 225,000. If I uh, if I at the end revalue and refinance against the increase in value, rent-wise, uh, I'd take my rent off the uh, my operating expenses off the rent, I'm getting a 5% net yield. So, so in a market where they people say, well, you can't make, you can't get good purchase price discounts because the market's peaking out, and you can't get cash flow in Auckland, well, I would say one way you can do it is to stop trying to buy a house cheap and renovate it. That does work, but you can stop trying to do that and do this, uh, which is make the margin through subdivision and construction of the dwellings. Uh, so, if you look at this, I could take that one, that total cost of completion of one five six five, uh, sell the old house, uh, and I'd have nine forty of debt. The residual assets are worth one point six, and so when I've knocked the sale of the old house off the uh, off the total amount of uh, asset, I now have just the two houses left at eight hundred each. So I have a 60% out loan to value ratio because I've sold the original house. And if you like, I'm parking the margin that I'm creating over the over the two brand new houses and I'm getting rid of the old house. So uh, the, my, my net yield then moves to 6% once I sell those two, once once I rent those two new, uh, new houses out, take off 12 grand for operating expenses, I'm getting a 6% net yield. So, Steve, I'm using subdivision to hold, to build my portfolio because I'm getting nice new houses and I'm producing quite good cash flow relative to what you get on average in Auckland and uh, I'm producing nice purchase price discounts out of it on the way in. So you're not you know, subdividing and cutting those sections off and selling sections, um, you're actually going to build the houses and keep them? Oh yeah, no, they, they are there, so I've built all three, I've subdivided, built, and I sold the original house, and I've kept the two new houses. Now somebody, of course, is saying, what about tax? What about GST, Matthew? And I'm going to come to that and talk about the tax and GST later in the presentation. Uh, but 
there's a development exemption where if you develop a house to hold it, you don't have to pay tax. It's tax exempt, and uh, it's also exempt GST. So uh, I'll talk more about that shortly. So we talked about this a few minutes ago: supply versus demand in Auckland, and I've got a nice graph here showing the rolling quarterly average of household formation, which is the blue uh, part of the graph, which is the, the population growth for the quarter divided by three, because there's an average of three people per household. So every three people that move into Auckland, it forms another household, and that's the blue graph, against the issuance of building consents, which is the red graph. So if you, if you look at the number of houses required to meet the population growth at three people per house, the blue, versus the issuance of building consents, you can see we just haven't been keeping up, and that's pent up demand. All that blue that's in excess of the red is hungry for a house, and the wealthier ones pay more and push the less wealthy ones out of Auckland, and there's your ripple effect and affordability uh, rippling out of Auckland into the regions. But of course, that blue graph makes Auckland quite resilient in a down market. At, uh, excess demand um, above the red line because when the country crashes from a shock event like a spike in interest rates, Auckland has that phenomenal demand and tight supply and uh, it makes it quite quite resilient, or it certainly did make it quite resilient in the last down cycle. Another thing I like to see Steve in a market, if I'm going to put money into it and borrow lots of money and invest in it, is uh, Good employment fundamentals, and you know, employment fundamentals to me are not just a high average income, but it's about the diversity of employment. And so, if you go to an area like uh, it's just a small, any small town in New Zealand that has, say, a meatworks or forestry or farming as its backdrop for employment, those small towns, if the employer falls on hard times. Uh, they're one horse towns or maybe two horse towns. If those horses start to wane because commodities are not pricing well uh, or there's something wrong in that industry, then of course everyone loses, loses employment. They lose employment, they can't pay their rents or they can't pay their mortgages, and more likely they leave that town and move to a place like Auckland where they can get a job. So hard recessionary times can lead to small towns drifting to large cities to get a job, which increases Auckland's resilience because you're getting that drift into Auckland to get a job. And that's because of Auckland's diversity of, of employment. So I want to see in a market from a fundamental perspective, tight supply, strong demand, and high average incomes with diversified employment. So where can we see that? Where can we see really good um, income fundamentals with bulletproof Diversified employment, obviously Auckland, but second to Auckland for me in the country is Hamilton, because Hamilton is kind of a satellite commercial city to Auckland now. Quite diversified employment, quite high average incomes, and it has quite tight supply and demand. If you look at the graphs, I've got up there in the other presentation uh, that we we didn't quite get to tonight. So uh, you know, Hamilton's actually looking really good. Uh, it's tight for supply. It's, socially, it's bad because <laughs> I, I I would predict that. Um, you know, Hamilton's going to be less volatile and have very strong growth based on the data that I've looked at for Hamilton. It's got so it's similar to Auckland a couple of years ago, um, and it has that diversified employment and high average income. And then the third and only other place in the country I'm interested in putting money, uh, based on these fundamentals: tight supply, strong demand, and high average incomes, is Wellington. Because <clears throat> Wellington's got the highest average income in the country with the government there. Sure, it's a bit of a one horse town with the government being the primary employer. Uh, okay, but, but it's a good horse and it, it, you know, it never wanes and uh, very high average incomes. And your, tight, your supply is actually very tight in the CBD and the fringe suburbs around the CBD. Uh, there's, there's no a good rugby team. Eh? Good rugby team. Oh, no comment, no comment. <laughs> um, so, yeah, Wellington's my third pick. And so then this is this is the point when someone says, what about Tauranga? You know, Tauranga's getting uh, 
pile of uh, Aucklanders moving down there. It's up 54% to the end of June, uh, you know, and it's a vibrant, growing environment. Well, I look at it and say, you know, people talk about $10 tower on this too. Have you heard that term, $10 tower on it? Yeah. It's, uh, you know, looking at the incomes down there, a lot of people are paid $10 cash. It's an old saying, so it's probably out of date now. Maybe it's $12 tower on it. <laughs> but people get paid cash under the table, which of course is unlawful, uh, because they can't afford to pay proper minimum wage and put it through the books and the bars and so forth. And I'm always shocked when I go and interview people in Tauranga as a tax consultant at how low the average incomes are down there. They are much lower than Auckland and, and uh, other regions that we will visit as tax consultants. Um, and the type, so that's point one, it has quite low average incomes. It doesn't have the diversity of depth and employment. It has the port and viticulture but not a heap more going on there. Uh, the, so it lacks the diversity of employment. On the supply side, uh, the Tauranga District Council are very good at releasing land supply. So it's actually got quite loose supply and they produce a lot of houses down there. And on the demand side, they, they are getting the demand, but I look at it and say, what type of demand is Tauranga getting? It's getting uh, a lot of baby, boom, uh, baby boomers cashing up the McMansion in Auckland, moving to Tauranga and buying a house in Pies Park or Bethlehem and uh, they pay cash for a million bucks. They put a million in the bank, they buy a two-year-old Japanese car, they sit in cafes on iPads, reading the New Zealand Herald and Skyping their kids who are in London or wherever they are. And you know these people are defensive of their money. They're not buying businesses, employing, trying to take over the world, they are in retirement stage defending their money, so it's not the same type of migration that Auckland has as a pattern coming into it. Young breeding age population that start business, that employ, that invest, that creates that vibrancy of employment and productive you know, economic engine that propels it forwards and makes it more resilient in a down market. So that's that would be my criticism of, uh, of Tauranga and why I'm not keen to put a heap of money there. Anyway, let's talk to the slide on the screen. Uh, and Auckland has a supply problem and the reaction to it has been uh, to rezone Auckland. And I want to talk about briefly the evolution of events leading to the rezone of Auckland's land supply. So in 2013, the, the new code for Auckland was notified, in other words, published. We had seven territorial authorities who amalgamated into the super city. And uh, so the Auckland super city said, well, it's ridiculous that we have seven sets of development controls and seven sets of rules and seven invoicing systems. That's all consolidated into one and just, uh, get one code for the whole of Auckland. And the goal of the Auckland strategic plan was to make Auckland the most livable city in the next 30 years. So they studied internationally successful cities and came up with the idea that you know, offshore cities that are successful don't sprawl like Los Angeles and London do. They intensify and go up. So they fill in the backyards with high density housing or they build terraced housing or high rise. So it's a much more intensified land use surrounding parks and services and good transport and infrastructure. The idea is to dilute the cost of running the city by having more people in a smaller, on a smaller amount of land so your services costs are more intensively used and that makes the rates cheaper per capita and that sort of thing. It also reduces the uh, congestion problems because there's, if you've got good transport next to high rise and so forth and people catch the train and the bus. So that was sort of the outcome of the study which is to make Auckland the most livable city we need to intensify its use. So the Auckland Unitary Plan fitted within the strategic plan and uh, pretty much rezoned, proposed to rezone all of Auckland uh, at various levels of zoning and this was uh, notified and published on the website in 2013. And so this, of course, was a lolly scramble. And I don't know, Steve, if you uh, saw my YouTube video on this, but 2013 I was saying, look, you've got all these people that their backyard is, is now able to be infilled, so they 
previously they might have a single lot, but now they've got a multi-lot subdivision possible, and they don't know it. And as I said before, a section of them, uh, three years ago was 400 grand, 375,000. So if they had a single lot and suddenly they could do three lot, they had 750,000 in their bank account and they hadn't noticed. So I noticed this and uh, I certainly told all my clients about it and said start buying because uh, there's going to be some really good buying, there's going to be some good gains when the new zoning comes through. So 2015, the uh, unitary plan was re-notified and they came up with a new version of it, having listened to the submissions for two years. And they said, well, having listened to the submissions, what we're going to do is take these high density zones and spread them more widely than previously uh, notified. Because basically they worked out that they weren't going to get enough people into Auckland. They needed 280,000 houses and they were only getting 80. So they just smeared high density zoning all over uh, previously uh, published areas as having low density zoning. And this caused outrage uh, early this year with the RAP uh, Residents Association uh, which encompasses Iraqi Mission Base and Hilly. It's quite a high demographic in Auckland. Uh, and, you know, those guys went berserk. They said, you're not coming into our backyard and telling us we're going to be low density and then suddenly uh, putting high density in here, putting blocks of flats next to us. You didn't notify it. It's illegal. We'll take you to the Environment Court. We'll take you, we'll take you all away. Uh, and so council responded to that and they reverted to the 2013 zones. So everybody thought, oh, okay, we're going to get these 2013 zones, which despite being more dense, they were one per 300 or one per 400 uh, in, in the mixed housing zones. One, that's one lot per 300 metres or one lot per 400 metres. And so if you went to the council website, it would say one per 300 or one per 400 metres. But if you went to the independent hearings panel evidence site <laughs> where council put their evidence, they said, oh look, we cocked this up. If we use these 2013 zones, we're only going to get 80,000 houses. Turns out we can't spread this high density zoning everywhere because we'll get sued by the Iraqi uh, Residents Association. So uh, instead what we'll do is we'll go for no zoning. Uh, I'm sorry, no, no density. As long as you meet the, the development controls. In other words, they'll adopt the same model that Wellington has in places like Wellington where they say as long as you can show your turning circles are working and height in relation to boundary, site coverage and, and uh, impermeable surfaces ratios, if all that stuff's ticking, then it doesn't need to be one per 400 because if you can get one per 200, you should be allowed to. So they published, council published earlier this year through the, the evidence, their intention that this should happen. So anyway, I got wind of this, I read it, and my town planner, who's particularly good, uh, brought it to my attention. So that was just a lolly scramble for anybody that saw that, because you could go to someone that was thinking either their house is not, gonna, is not subdivisible, I'm moving to Tauranga, uh, and you're getting free land, or you go to somebody that would think it was 1 per 300 or 1 per 400, because that's what the council website said, but you could actually get you know, much higher density. So there was, there's been free land in Auckland, over the last couple of years. And anybody that came to one of my workshops knew that because I've been rabbiting on about it and sticking it on YouTube. Any, anyway, here we are in 2016 and uh, the Auckland Unitary Plan is now operating with some minor exceptions. And so what's happened is the new notified rules are in, the, uh, the hearings panel has reported, council has adopted their uh, their recommendations with some minor exceptions and there's a little bit of appeal going on. There's 106 appeals but it's only over a uh, half dozen quite minor things. So Steve, this is the latest thing that's going on in Auckland. Uh, the, the New Zealand Herald and the reporters are saying, oh the unitary plan's not operating because it's subject to appeal. But that information's actually quite misleading and incorrect. It is operating. The only parts of it that are not operating are the parts under appeal. So for example, if you're in a heritage area and you're trying to knock down a villa, uh, under the unitary plan you might be allowed to knock it down, but that's being appealed. So you're not allowed to knock it down because the former plan is operating because that part's under appeal.
But if you want to uh, chop up a site that's a thousand meters and it's urban zoning, urban zoning has no density, and uh, and you look at the former zoning, it might be you know residential six A or six B or something like that, which might give you two or three lots, and you might think it had, based on what you're reading in the Herald, oh, we have to use the former operative plan, but actually there's no appeals in the urban zonings that would relate to such a site, so you get no density, you're probably going to get five or six houses on it. So I still think that there's an opportunity here in the uh, you know quite confusing times that are out there with the rezones, because people don't understand how these rules are applying, uh, and it's being mis misreported. Uh, most important thing here is to get a good planner who knows this. And you get different planners out there, different grades. It's the same with accountants, you get good accountants and bad ones. Um, and I think it's the same with planners. So why is this rezone so interesting to investors? There's lots of money in land. Uh, vendors not understanding the value of the land in the back in, in their backyards. So you're getting underpricing of subdivisible land in, in some cases. Uh, a client of mine yesterday bought a site in Papatoi. Uh, the vendor sold it as a three lot and it had a resource consent for three and under the unitary plan we can get a consent for five. So there's two sections in the backyard. This is what I mean, this is why it's interesting for investors. Remember each of those sections have got to be 400 plus. So that's money in the backyard. So in, in, in Auckland subdivision, just waiting for my slide to click, uh, you've, you, as I said you've got these two plans operating. Uh, you've got the old district plans from seven territorial authorities, but only the bits that are under appeal, which is only a half dozen points, and most of them won't affect the sites that you'd be operating on as a small-scale developer. So the unitary plan, it says PORP, but it's now the ORP, it's, it you know, was the proposed unitary plan, it's now operating, and uh, most of its rules are actually applying. So with that in mind, I'd bring to the attention of the viewers, they can go here to uh, the independent, he independent hearings panel version and look at what they have recommended and uh, just see what the zonings are. I think I've got an example here. View the maps here, press view the maps and uh, up comes a picture once you view the map of this. So this is a property I own in Sunland Strive and Manurewa and uh, it's suburban zoning and so that's how you find out what the zoning is. And then of course you need to understand what the zoning rules are. Um, so you know, any of the mixed housing zones, mixed housing suburban or urban, are fantastic from a developer's perspective, as are the terraced housing zones up here. And you know, get a, get a town planner and, and work through it with the town planner. So if you want to do this, this is how you do it. You the basic process of buying a Subdivisible property, it's not rocket science. You find a property with a large section, uh, perhaps 900 metres plus, and there's lots of them in Auckland, they're everywhere. Uh, you work out the density rules, which you can get from a town planner. You uh, then make sure that you've got services because you can't subdivide unless you've got drainage and, and uh, access to water and stormwater and so forth. You then do your numbers and work out what it's going to cost to develop it, and you can use. Uh, surveyors and subdivision consultants to help you do that. They'll help you work out what the cost to completion would be, and then work out what the value is. You work backwards from that and make an offer. Um, you get the property in contract. Um, you then, once it's in contract, you then get town planning reports. And one thing I always want my clients to do, Steve, is verify before they go unconditional. And with subdivision, you know, it can be an absolute problem if you, if you get it wrong. So by getting a surveyor or a town planner to write your town planning report, verifying what you think is right, uh, then you've got them in contract and you can you can obviously hold them accountable if the advice is wrong. So once you know, oh it's a three lot or a four lot, and you can rely on that, uh, you need to work out what the cost of that's going to be, so they can also help you with that. And then so what it's worth, uh, minus what it's going to cost you, you can then verify what you're paying for it, and then go back and have another look at renegotiating it, see if you can get the price down a bit further, and, and buy the site and go unconditional. So once you've got it, uh, it's actually pretty straightforward. So you get a surveyor to go in there, he surveys the site, and you give that to a, a 
a building company, they draw up a scheme plan and work out the services and development controls. Um, they prepare an application for resource consent, uh, or they give that to a town planner who will do that. Sometimes you get both in one place. You get your resource consent, you get your engineering drawings done by an engineer, you do your civil works, um, you pick up your titles and your code of compliance for your civil works, and uh, at that point you now have um, bare land ready to build on, which you can optionally build on if you want if you want to. Um, and, I, and when I'm building, I always pour the drive last, just a tip there. A lot of people pour the drive as soon as they, they can to get the titles. But if you do that, the next thing, the builder arrives and drives a digger down the drive and he trashes it. So you want to pour the drive last. So just a few more examples to bring this to life, because I know there's been a lot of words there. Um, and I think um, real life examples bring, bring things to life. So I just showed you this one. It's Bruce Bear Way. It's a three lot. And uh, it's a last year example, so December last year, so it's not that old. But here's uh, another one from uh, this is another one from late last year. Uh, you can see on the left hand side, it's a triangular piece of land, 960 meters um, out west in West Auckland. And I'm building two houses on the front, and I lift and shift that house to the rear. Uh, so number three is an existing house moved to the rear. And so there's, there it is there, uh, lot one, two, and three, drops into, th into three sites, 961 metres. So here's, here's some numbers from it, paid 725 for it. Uh, it's about 800 grand to build two 200 metre brick and tile townhouses and lift and shift, shift the house. It's about 325 for the subdivision costs. Just the... Water care and Auckland development contribution will be 37 each for each additional lot. So you've got 74 grand to council and those subdivision works before you do anything, uh, before you get consents or talk to engineers or designers or town planners or put drainage in the ground, put concrete. You've got 74 grand before you even start. So people often underestimate that cost. Um, some construction finance there. So total cost is 1.9. Values at 2.475, so it's about 550 um, profit in that site. So working way across there, build, um, build cost, subdivision cost, uh, construction finance cost, and there's the margin on the right. So they're quite tasty little sites. I mean, you know, how hard do you work to earn half a million dollars? And it's half a million after tax if you choose to keep the site and not sell it. So let's dig a bit deeper. So this is what I'm building, 360,000 on the left. Two of those, lot, lot one and two will look like that. And on the numbers, uh, just as a land bank holding it without having built it, if I do nothing, it's netting 2.7% on those numbers. So that's the uh, orange, the orangey, but up here in the middle, 2.7 percent of rent minus operating expenses. So when I take away loan interest at five percent, it's minus 16,000 pre-tax, minus 11 after tax. When you go through and look at it, if I built it, hang on, one click back. Ho oh, hum. Uh, so if you look at it after development. I've now got two more houses, and they'll rent at 700 bucks a week a week out west. So my net yield goes to 4.1. So it's gone from 2.7 to 4.1. So cash flow gets better if I build them, and practically speaking, it's around the same overall dollar value, 17 grand. But it's 4.1 because it's a much larger amount of money. So it's still producing minus 17 grand as, as a percentage. The difference between the net yield. And the interest cost. So minus 17, that's quite tough. What if we sell the original house for 675, which is valuation, pay an agent to sell it, our debt would drop from 1.92 to 1.269, and the residual assets with 1.8, so the margin of 530 after I've paid the agent drops out. And if I look at the 530 margin as a percentage of the new the new developed asset value being two of these that I'm hanging on to, 
uh, I've got a 70% loan to value ratio if I use all debt. And that means to get to 60%, I have to leave 190 grand in the investment. So I'm locking up 190 and I get two of those and I make 530,000. So if you look at the cash, and I'll get to tax in a minute because I know you, uh, the longer term investors are saying, hey, what about tax? I'm going to talk about that in a minute. So here I've got net yield on houses retained, 59 grand. I've got interest of 63. So my pre-tax cash flow is four and a half grand negative. After tax, three grand. Not bad for two of those uh, in a portfolio. I've, got, I've made half a million dollars and I'm only four and a half grand after tax with 189 grand locked up. So, uh, but you wouldn't leave 60 percent, would you? Matt? Go to 80 because it's a new build anyway, wouldn't you? Well, it doesn't actually work like that because what you get it's a good, good question. What you get is you get 60 percent on the original purchase because when you buy this, it's got a dwelling on it. Mm -hmm. It's going to go back a slide. It's got a dwelling on it, and that dwelling can be rented out. So the bank's approach from a funding perspective. Here it is here if you look at the bottom right corner, that original house in there, that's a rental property because it's rented out. So they only give me 60. And anybody that tries to do this, you're only going to get 60. And then what they'll give you is they'll give you 80% of the subdivision cost and 80% of the build. And then at the end, you get to keep the higher of 60 for the purchase price of the of the original house plus 80 on the on the build and subdivision cost or 60 of the end value. So, and then of course when you do the next one, they want to see that the last one is at 60 on the end value. So you get pushed back to the 60% LVR. These LVR rules are tight and they are biting developers who also invest to, to hold. Here's another one, uh, Bowbank Road, exactly the same thing. Uh, I'm building the same house because uh, I can't be bothered to design another one. And I'm pre-costed on it, so it makes it easy for me to work out what it's going to cost to build it. And this is a 1600 meter site. So you say you can't get sites in Auckland, which is everywhere. Here's a 1600 meter site, um, long driveway, <coughs> services a million miles away, so they're quite expensive to get services in. That's stormwater, the green stuff. Uh, sewers are right, there's the sewer there, the, the red stuff. Um, so what I'll do here is I'll lift and shift this house to the back and I'll put three in front. Here's the subdivision plan over here. One, two, three new houses that look like this. And uh, the original lifted and shifted to the back. So same same strategy as uh, the prior slides and uh, there's 800 grand in that site. And I paid 950 for it in April this year. So, um, you know, this, this stuff's really in Auckland. Um, that's a good site because it's large. Um, which gives me generous spaces. Um, so I've currently got 12 of these sites and uh, um, that I'm personally involved in, and they're all three or four lot subdivisions. Um, and some of my clients are also doing that, so I give them a hand uh, with their costings and so forth because it is quite it is quite challenging. You need a bean counter on board for that sort of thing, or at least a quantity survey. So I've talked a little bit about tax, and I want to, um, tax is quite boring, so sorry to bore you, but you need to understand the tax surrounding subdivision if you're going to get into it. So when you subdivide to hold, <coughs> if you, I'm sorry, when you subdivide a property that you've acquired uh, within 10 years of acquiring it, so you subdivide before 10 years of ownership, if you sell, you're automatically taxable. Okay, so when you sell, you're automatically taxable if you subdivide and sell within 10 years. Now, subdivision for rental investment or long-term investment is specifically tax exempt under CB23. Okay, so you get taxed under CB12 of the Income Tax Act, and you get exempted if you subdivide for long-term rental investment. So, subdivide to build to hold, no tax. Brilliant. Uh, lawfully not pay tax. There it is, right there your tax exemption, which is why I tend to subdivide to hold keep them because uh, yeah, I make more. So building to sell is of course taxable. So CB7 will catch the business of dealing or uh, selling property that you've constructed. But if you if you build to hold, you're not caught by CB7 because you're not in the business of selling. So build to hold, not taxable. Uh, subdivide to hold, not taxable. Uh, good way to amass wealth uh, by being a developer and not having to pay tax. Just don't sell it. Now GST, 
you are exempt on the long-term holds. Uh, and there's a case called Newlands and the ID. Uh, and this was a Bearland subdivision, one into four. I'm sorry, that should say Newlands, not Newlands, Newlands, N-E-W-M-A-N-S, typo there. So uh, Bearland subdivision was a one into four lot subdivision. The, it was someone's home. They subdivided three off and they sold it. And the court held that that was not subject to GST because it didn't meet the requirements to become subject to GST. So pretty much that case is held up as a statement to say, well, if you're just going to do one of these and you're going to subdivide uh, less than five, i.e. one into four, then you won't constitute a tax for activity for GST and cause GST to become payable. So if you have larger sites, then you end and you start selling and you end up having uh, GST is an issue, and you might have to have a pro rata GST payment on the number of sections you sell and so forth. Mm. So at this point, Steve, you're probably going to pick me up and say, hang on, Matthew, you do a one into three or one into four and you sell the original house. Should you have to pay tax on that? And uh, that's a good point. And what I'd say to that is you do have to pay tax. It is a taxable disposal, but when you look at the cost of that original house, it's the bulk of your original purchase price. Mm -hmm. So uh, it actually, it is taxable, but by the time you take off the share of subdivision cost, the cost of that house, the land under that house, uh, the financing cost related to it, you find you actually break even. It's taxable that you break even on most examples you look at, I've looked at. So there's a little bit of a tax break there, which is why I tend to sell the original house. Well, so you've got to claim GST on the original house. Um, and then pay GST back on the sale of the original house, but not claim or pay GST on the new two new builds. Is that right? I lost you there. You're not claiming any GST. No GST is claimed, so, and no GST is paid. It's exempt GST because if you're full or less. Yep. Okay. Sure. And there's no income tax uh, on the ones you hold, and on the one you sell, it is taxable. But because the cost of it is loaded up with the original house purchase you tend to make no money on it. Or if you do make money, it's a small amount of money, so a very small amount of tax. So overall, the bulk of your development margin is, is sheltered as a capital gain, as long as you hold the properties long term. Sure. Now here's an interesting thing, a little known part of the Income Tax Act that's had a bit of press lately is the taxation on the issuance of resource consents or changes of zoning, CB14. And basically this will tax a property that is sold within 10 years, uh, and the land has been subject to uh, a change of zoning or the granting of a consent by council or anything similar in nature. And at least 20% of the gain relates back to the zoning change or the granting of the consent. So if you have those three things, you're taxable on the gains, uh, but you get a bit of a discount for how long you hold it. It's quite complicated uh, and it, it, it's, it sounds boring and, it's, and it is boring, <laughs> but you need to know this because in Auckland at the moment, particularly with unitary plan operating, uh, you're getting all of these rezones and profit result that's coming out of the rezoning, so people could be selling things and not realising they have to pay tax. So I've got a couple of examples here for you. So let's say, Steve, you buy a property for half a million dollars in Auckland as a rental property. And, oh, yeah. uh, eh? <laughs> Sorry, where's this half million dollar house in Auckland? Oh, everywhere. Get them everywhere. Really? Uh, yeah. Um, just go down south and uh, head southwest through Clendon and Weymouth, and you'll find their stuff down there at that price point back into Otara. It's not doesn't have a big backyard, uh, and it's not a new house. It's probably a bit rough, but you know that's what your uh, tutors boys up here are buying all the time, and they spend thirty, fifty grand on it, and they trade it. So um, you know the average is a million. But there's stuff that's 10 million dragging the average up, up and there's stuff that's four to 500 here. It's just um, not pretty. Anyway, the Auckland Unitary Plan rezones re it to high density. And so as a result, you can build 10 houses on it. Okay, so you got lucky. Um, and so the land value jumps from half a million by a million dollars to 1.5 million due to the change of zone. And you've owned it three years. Okay. So obviously it's a pretty implausible example because uh, somebody else would have worked it out and paid a lot more for it. But let's just say that you did this. You bought this property, it's a rental property, and it went up due to a change of zone and you've owned it three years. 
It's a long-term hold, and you sell it due to a change of circumstances. Is this taxable? So ordinarily, long-term investment, change of circumstances, you're getting divorced, you're going broke, whatever the change of circumstances are, it's pushed you to sell it, that would not be taxable. But here, you have the issuance of a resource, of a, you've got a change of zoning, which has caused the profit to jump. Is it taxable? The, profits, the, the profit attributable to the uh, change of zone in this case is a million dollars which is all of the gain, you've owned it three years, so the taxable profit is a million minus 10% times three years because you get a, a reduction of 10% for each year that you own it. So you've got 700,000 of taxable profit, less disposal costs. So you know that will surprise a lot of people because they're thinking it's long-term uh, properties, long-term investments are not taxable, you're not a developer, you're not a dealer, you're just selling a property you changed your mind on, but if the value has jumped because of the rezone, uh, that could affect you. So another example, Steve, you buy a property and opt as a home. Same same property, but you this time you own it in a trust. And uh, you get a rezone, suddenly you can put 10 properties on it, and the land value jumps by a million, same sorts of facts. You've only got three years, and you sell it to a developer. Okay, so that's why you step up in value because the developer swoops in and buys it. Is this taxable? So this is slightly different. This is the sale of a family home which has a specific tax exemption available to it. And uh, it's been rezoned and you're selling to a developer. So let's look at the, the answer. So here, the CV18 home exemption applies to individuals. And notice that you own the home in a trust. So you can't claim that home exemption against the resource consent rezone. The second thing is, to get the, the home exemption, you've got to sell it to another person acquiring it as a home for residential purposes. And you sold to a developer. So you, you wouldn't have qualified for that home exemption for, if either of those two things happened. Either, either you had it in the trust or you sold it to a developer. Uh, so you don't get the relief as a developer, the sale would be taxable because of this, it's your home, it's been rezoned and it becomes taxable. Uh, so I, I see a increase of IRD interest and activity on things like this in the next few years where they'll be looking for areas that have had super high density uplifts um, in rezones and people have sold the houses, they'll get nasty tax bills, it's something to watch. Let's go, let's look at a subdivide to hold example. And here, let's say we build three properties and they're worth 2.450, 2.450. And uh, you take out finance, subdivision, and the initial house purchase, it's all identical. If you're selling or you're holding, you get the same gross, gross profit or development margin. But if you're selling, you pay 3% to the agent, 65 grand in GST and income tax 142. So you end up with 289, and if you're holding, you get the whole 570. And then you take out the uh, capital gain, let's say, oh, I'm sorry, you're adding the capital gain on the holding, and let's say 8% for 10 years in Auckland, straight line, that's 450. And of course, if you had sold it, you'd have 289,000. So let's invest that 5% straight line for 10 years so that we're getting a return on that money. Uh, and so you end up with a million bucks versus four, 433,000, which is you know close to 2.4 times better off if you're holding. So that's my commercial, one of my commercial observations in making a decision whether you're going to sell prop, develop to sell, develop to hold. Uh, you firstly have a better tax profile, and you don't pay real estate agents if you hold at all. And secondly, you get the great capital gain if you choose the right areas on the stuff that you hold. So I think that's quite a powerful slide and quite a powerful concept uh, for investors to get their heads around. Your comments, Steve. Well, you put a compelling argument there, and um, I'm actually just going through the, the numbers of something very similar for myself at the moment, and um, looking at you know ability to re-borrow versus cash flow of keeping the property versus um, a straight sale and possibly being, you know, inflicted with unreasonable amounts of tax. And um, that's and something that I'll bring to you myself as well, actually. Mm, but, yeah. um, 
you know, I think also if, you, if you've got something like that and you've done the development and you've actually got new houses on the site, um, you know, why wouldn't you hold it? You've got new housing stock that's not going to need maintenance for 10 years. Um, yeah. Beautiful new houses. You will be and, then, and then if you, if you want to get more targeted in your construction of dwellings, you can start to build high density things that have dual income streams on them. So you mm. get built to purpose for investors with higher cash yields because you build tighter, uh, you know, tighter small properties and get two of them on one title. And with the rezone of Auckland, uh, that's getting easier. So one of the things I'd say is it's so important to get your tax structure right on this stuff and to get the tax planning right. Uh, and if people would like a hand with this sort of thing, they can come to GRA uh, and we have a free initial interview. It's a 30 minute initial interview to new clients. Uh, which you can block at that website, www.gra.co.nz. So that was the commercial break. <laughs> um, let's keep pushing forwards. So wanted to just rip through a few of my land banking examples. So these are assets I acquire that are, are subdivisible, but I won't necessarily develop them anytime soon. Uh, because what you get if, with a land bank, if you buy a property that is got a single house in it, but you can put five houses on it. Well, what you've got going up in value is the five houses. You don't have to build them to get the growth on them. Because in 12, 13 years' time, if they're worth double, uh, a developer will come and say, hey, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, those houses that were 900 grand in Auckland uh, are now worth 1.8. And you can put five of them on the site. So there's $4.5 million worth of growth on the potential of the site. And the construction inflation on building those five assets is not four and a half million, it's a lot less. The assets going up by uh, Auckland Capital Growth Rates or wherever it is you're doing this, but the construction inflation is going up at about 3%. So you get a big gap opening up and uh, land banking is very powerful. You know, the, the more land, the more potential of development, the higher the growth. So some examples of this, and, and you know, that's philosophically behind why I'm buying these assets. I can get these slides to move forwards. Here's one I bought, uh, and, and a couple of these assets I own with mates. I invest with a couple of mates up here. Uh, and this one was Slash Chan, who's an accountant here at GRA, and uh, quite a good investor that I invest with. Uh, that, the house in the middle, that little villa, there's 74 Jervoys Road up in Ponsonby. Right next to it is the Jervoys Steakhouse. If you've ever had dinner there, it's really good. Uh, and anyway, this is Herne Bay, very high capital growth area in Auckland and very expensive area. A house maybe 400 metres from this one sold for $24 million uh, earlier this year. So this is a very high demographic area and mixed demographics. You've got some low, low demographics in there as well, Herne Bay. <clears throat> anyway, a dirty old villa, it's a duplex. Uh, and this will astonish the out of Aucklanders. Uh, we're getting, we're getting sixteen hundred dollars a week rent for that. Um, so it's a tiny villa, and the right hand side of it is nine hundred bucks a week, and the left hand side of it is uh, seven fifty. Two bedrooms on the left, and two on the right. And the guy on the right uses it as a commercial premises at the front, and has a couple of bedrooms at the back. Astonishingly high rent, uh, crazy, crazy, I don't understand it. But anyway, that's what it is. Paid 1.2 for it uh, December before last. And what we can put on this is something like this. So what I've got going up in value is a five-story building. Uh, level three, four, and five have sea views over the Harbour Bridge. Uh, one and two uh, uh, just, just have street views. And so it's about probably about 12 million to build that building uh, at the moment. And the end value, if I was to add up the value of the stock inside that is about 16 at the moment. Uh, so there's a margin in it with the unitary plan now operating, but if it's 16 end value and in 12 years time it's doubled, then it's 32, there's $16 million worth of growth. And the 12 million cost of completion in 13 years time might be 18 million, you know, so costs go up eight and the asset value goes up by 16. So you get an extra eight million implied in the in the asset value from the underlying land use. So that's an example of a land bank, that's why I own that asset. 
Another example is this horrible commercial dwelling in Glen Eden, opposite the Glen Eden supermarket, uh, Boot IT Fitness. We, uh, we bought that three years ago for 400 grand. See the train here? It's right on the train tracks. And this year we bought this car yard here. So that's about 1,600 metres, and we can go 20 storeys and put uh, quite a large building on that site. So we own from the red boundary right down to this building down the centre here. That's, that's all ours. So we can put a great big colossal building on that, and uh, that's bulk and locations. So this is commercial downstairs, parking, residential. It's a six storey building. <coughs> we can do 20, you know, it's a high density. Um, mixed use business site, so it's got very good zoning. So it's only cost us 1.4 over three years. It's uh, got a um, about a 7% net yield, so it's cash positive. And uh, we have this massive building that's going up in value over the next 10 to 20 years. So we don't necessarily intend to build it, but one day a developer will come along and say, hey, you've owned this building 15 years, Matthew. Uh, we see we can build this really expensive building on it. Uh, what do you want for it? And they'll pay me a handsome sum for it because the value of that end building will have gone up uh, an enormous amount of value. <coughs> this is another one of Great North Road, same story. That's the rear house, that's the front house. Um, paid 1.35, spent 100 grand, subdivided, revalued at 2.25 uh, yesterday. I think that's conservative. Um, so it's, you know, on paper, 800 grand older than that, but I think it would be more like a million. Um, and it's all boarding house rented by the room, so it's actually producing enormous cash flow, positive cash flow. So it's a nice one. Um, another thing that I'm into, Steve, is relocatables. And I was looking to do this in Wellington. Haven't managed to find a site yet. But uh, you can see on the left, it's three lot sites by the time we subdivide it. And uh, we have bought three relocatables, sort of 20, 30 grand each. And we relocate them onto the house site. And by the time they're on there, they're about 300. Then there's some subdivision and funding. Uh, they value in Mangor East, where that one is, at about 1.9. So there is. Uh, just trying to get my screen to click. There's about 580,000 on that site, and the cash rate 4.9% is very good. So, you know, another uh, another excellent uh, subdivision development uh, thing to do is relocatable properties where um, you're doing a subdivision, but instead of building new houses, you're building second hand houses. So, I tend to use relocatables in areas with lower demographics because I don't want to overcapitalize build new houses in some of these areas, uh, you can actually spend too much and not get your money back. So uh, that's why I chose to use relocate relocatables there. Very, very uh, finitically process that one. You need a bunch of people to give you a hand, town planners and um, project managers and so forth, because it's, it's actually a lot of work doing relocatables. They're quite complicated. Uh, it's another site that uh, I did last year, Eastwood Terrace, in uh, Hearn Bay, St Mary's Bay, just next to Hearn Bay. Got a nice subdivision and resource consent to build this nice pretty uh, house here. Um, and there's four behind it. This is a Darren Jessup design. He's a very clever architect in Auckland. Beautiful, beautiful design. Uh, and we were actually going to develop this to hold it. Uh, but by the time we finished the design, the cost blew out. Uh, over three million, <laughs> so you know, it, it's a sloping uh, fourteen hundred meter site down a hill, and it was so expensive to build. So in the end, a foreign investor wrote us a check and took it off his, uh, took it off our hands, and it was sold. So <clears throat> with that in mind, uh, I guess a bit of a recap. Um, there's some good strategy in there: land banking, uh, relocatables. Subdivide and build new. Uh, keep it, don't sell it. If you keep it, you get the tax exemptions. If you sell it, you're going to get bled with tax and real estate agents fees. So it's a smart thing to do to keep it. And of course, be careful where you do this. Uh, stick to the areas that have tight supply, strong demand, 
uh, diversified income bases and high average incomes. Uh, why do you do that? Because you're more likely to get growth because it's more resilient in a down market. The markets don't crash as badly in those areas. Um, I've learned that lesson myself, Steve, where I've bought land in small towns, uh, where I've been doing subdivisions, Cromwell and, and uh, Gisborne, I was doing some large subdivisions, and I just got absolutely clobbered during the GFC, had to liquidate stock out of those areas, uh, because they're just volatile. Um, and, uh, you know, so that's why I learned my lesson and I tend to do the developments and keep them in, in areas that have the high average incomes because if I've sold something, more likely someone can settle it. Uh, the banks like them more so they continue to fund these areas. You can get finance there when the market gets hard. Uh, so it's less volatile, you get less downside in the asset value and uh, you um, get an easier ride. So if somebody would like to talk to me, that's, that's my contact. <coughs> uh, subdivision is a technical area. We can give you a hand with the tax and legal stuff. We can introduce you to our supply chain of uh, uh, surveyors, engineers, and town planners. So we can help you with all the content in this presentation.